Okay, so today's class is about, so it's, it's a segue of what we did before uh, a few weeks ago. And this one actually is to better assess the scope of an idea. So I, I know you've, di you've been doing some work uh, on, on, you know, working on a, an idea, uh, making sure that, you know, it has a, a lot of details. But there's actually uh, a way also to assess the scope in a, I would say, more holistic way. And, and this is why I'm, I'm, I'm explaining to you today. Um, and th again, this class will be on uh, my YouTube channel. So you could uh, get back to it if you don't understand something. Again, if you have any questions, just raise your hand and I'll, and I'll answer in any language. Um, okay, so, so the way I start this class is I always look at what we've done last time. So you can see where are we, summary of the last class, because I think a few, week, uh, a few weeks uh, passed since we had the last class. So let me start. So this class is a three-faceted class uh, course. Um, I, I'm teaching you uh, methods and school of thoughts, framework. This is important because y you cannot do everything in an ad hoc manner. It, people have been doing this before, and people have been uh, you know, contributing uh, to best practices. So it's good to know what exists so you can apply them. Uh, the second thing is that uh, we also look at different levels of, uh, of uh, I would say, granularity for ideas. If you work as an R&D department, or if you're a portfolio manager or corporate, the way you manage ideas is a bit different. The way you assess the value of an idea is different. So it's important because you have different priorities. If you're an R&D shop, uh, you know, you, you kind of, be not, you should, obviously, uh, you should be aligned with the business, but like it's, you're not, you know, thinking of the general strategy for the business. Whether like if a corporate level, you know, it, you manage ideas or project in different manners. So we'll exp I explain this thing in this class. And last but not least is the tools that we use. I want to make you aware that uh, we can do things differently than with Post-its or with uh, Excels. Uh, um, Excel sheets uh, and the likes. So this is uh, the part about tools, technology. I'll also explain you what the open innovation is, uh, tools for uh, crowdsourcing uh, and the likes. So there's lots of these things, uh, technology that we'll see. So that's the class. I say from the R&D team perspective, uh, usually uh, there's uh, too many ideas, not too few. Uh, we're looking at the thing you guys have been doing like last week and the last actually two weeks is generating that funnel, that pipeline of ideas. And now we are at the point where we're selecting ideas. So this is really the, uh, the, um, the, uh, you know, the, 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 the status. And as you can see, uh, the pipeline of ideas is, is large, but like often this is, there's too many half-baked ideas. Do you understand what half-baked means, right? It's like, you know, people just throw an idea, but they don't really have a lot of details, right? And so, so it's good actually, and you be experiencing uh, that thing, is that uh, the idea that people uh, bring, they need to be uh, developed, you know? They need to be, uh, uh, they need to put some meat around that. So there's a lot of incremental ideas lying around going nowhere. So. Uh, first of all, so when we have a large um, set of ideas, it's a good thing to find simple criteria to differentiate them and apply. So I think you've been also looking at this, the way you choose uh, your ideas, uh, especially when you have a large set, should be simple. If you try to do a scorecard for every idea and you have 300, that might be a bit uh, <coughs> tedious. So it's, uh, it's better actually to uh, have some simple method at the beginning and then go incrementally uh, in testing ideas. So that's really the, um, you know, the, uh, the important aspect here. And I also explained to you that uh, there are several methods that you can find to uh, uh, assess or, or, or classify ideas. Uh, I think it's very academic, this type of methods. I mean, there are a few important ones that are used in practice. Uh, ID voting is a good, good one because, you know, it's a social aspect. It's a social method. You can actually involve 
uh, external stakeholders, like people, the people you work with in the companies, you can actually invite them to vote for some of the ideas. It's a simple mechanism. It's, a, it's the equivalent to the Facebook like. Um, and, um, and like the scorecard, the scorecard is quite efficient, especially when there are uh, you know, a few ideas left, like 30 or so. Or so. I think it's actually quite useful. So, uh, but there's many way people try to assess ideas, and uh, I actually summarized 25 of them here with the several properties. So that's the that's the uh, the uh, you can have also um, the the summary of the idea is is written here on the side. Uh, sorry, the method to classify these is, is written here on the side. So that's the. Uh, so what do you want to test? I think this is uh, perhaps the most important thing that I explained uh, last, uh, in the last class is that uh, always think about this. When you're trying to test ideas, you make assumption under three types of umbrellas for ideas. The first one is desirability. Is this a market? Who's interested in anybody in my idea? Viability and feasibility. The criteria that you guys chose are somehow connected to one of this thing, right? And uh, we obviously, you can have like things that are more like detailed or granular than this one. But at, at least those are three types of ideas, uh, uh, assumptions, the assumptions you make of, about uh, your ideas. And it really helps you to assess if you have something that might be, you know, have a market, might be viable in terms of economics. Can you make money with that thing? And feasible. Uh, and what you do is that uh, to assess these dimensions, you actually set up a testing framework. So we've been starting to uh, look at this testing framework, and especially I mentioned to you uh, that behavioral testing is quite powerful. It's something that you know, uh, people are very uh, eager to use whenever that's possible. Uh, and the main reason I, I mentioned this is because you know, if you ask people opinion, it might be, you know, not perhaps very reliable, right? I think you, we discussed about this. Is that, you know, people lots of time they will they will tell you do something, but they might do something else. So testing behavior whenever this is possible, especially for the desirability, is actually uh, a good thing. And, and you know, the simple test is that when you come up with an idea, or where we, you show something to people, look at their reaction, look at what people, uh, how people act with this. So put them in terms of, uh, in front of multiple solutions, and if they pick up yours, I think it's a good sign that, uh, without telling it's yours, right? It's a good sign actually that it might be uh, a good idea. So that the testing framework is something that is is quite important. Do you have any questions so far about this? This is uh, what we did last time. I was mentioning multiple types of testing. So you will choose, uh, especially when you get to the, uh, the KDZ day, uh, you will choose method to uh, test ideas. And in the big uh, lines, uh, this is really what uh, you, know, you can do to test ideas. So test behavior, not opinion, whenever possible. It's not always possible, but whenever it's possible. Um, and especially, uh, in terms of testing strategy, I mentioned a few ones. Uh, the fake product, uh, try to put something out there that is not the real product, and you look at people's reaction. Why do you want to do this? Is because if you create really the product and you spend all your budget and money to do it and nobody buys it, you know, it's wasted money. So, so that's basically uh, the point of making a fake product is just to test the appeal of the product. Then the Flintstone, it's, it's somewhere in between, right? The Flintstone is the, you know, it's an analogy to this uh, cartoon when uh, people have a running car, but there's no engine in it. So thing might seem to be running, but there's no engine in it. Right? It's no thing, you know? Like the, the concept of uh, the idea wall that I brought to you this year, uh, that I use also for my class in Japan, is typically a Flintstone, right? I'm using Google Keep. But like, you know, I have to extract the information by hand from Google Keep. It's not a totally uh, a, a, a real product. If I wanted to have a real product, I should, you know, have something that basically provide, uh, uh, that provides the same uh, functionality 
but it's more integrated. So I don't have to go manually extract the uh, uh, data using Google Takeout and, and this type of, uh, and, and the code that I had to write myself for this. So, so uh, obviously a product will be more integrated. But the point is to do a proof of concept and show that it's actually valuable, or hopefully I think it's valuable to uh, you know, manage ideas in that way. So that's the point of this. So typically the idea wall, which I refer to the, the use of Google Keep with this 4K TV and, and, and the likes, this is a Flintstone. MVP is a bit, you have, perhaps I've heard about this in the industry, the MVP is a bit more involved when uh, you will, this is typically what startup company uh, strive to do when they try to come up with a product and assess several aspects of it. So they build the product incrementally and they try to test features uh, with uh, the market before they perhaps uh, uh, create the full feature. Um, so that's the, um, that's the, the, the point of doing an MVP. Uh, I also pointed to you uh, that, I pointed, I pointed that, 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 uh, that video uh, called the element of creativity. Uh, you remember that thing? Uh, who, who watched the whole thing? Or who looked at the, this video again? Okay, so uh, I, we, we, we watched that thing together, right, last time, a little bit, did we? Okay, so, oh, perhaps it was not working. Oh, you know what, because there was no sound. And, uh, and I, I, what I mentioned is that, um, yeah, because the, if you look at the video, the one that I pointed from last year, there was no sound. Oh, sorry about that. But uh, the re you have to look at the remastered. And if you look at the remastered version, then um, um, I, I, I'm going to put the link for you in the, uh, in the thing here. Um, in the 70s with groups like Aerosmith and Heart. And, and um, uh, you know, that might be give you some inspiration. Look at that video. Um, let me... Do we have, like, the sound or... Uh, we have speakers, right? So we should get some sound one way or another. Is there... Okay, there you go. So let me... There you go. Okay, let me show you a bit of this. All right. Boston, then during the 80s heavy metal craze and... On. So this, this two part basically, is, it talks, it's very uh, much about artists and how they, they come up with new things. And, uh, and, and looking at this thing, you can, get, uh, you can actually get an idea how people are coming with, uh, with new ideas and things. So a lot about copying and uh, things. So let me show you, okay, here. Creativity comes by. Uh, that the whole the whole part in the, in the beginning is about like movies and artists and, and music. But look at uh, starting like around like um, minute like uh, four, 13, 14. Okay, so let me try to put it a little bit louder. Okay. The act of creation is surrounded by a fog of myths. Myths that creativity comes via inspiration, that original creations break the mold, that they're the products of geniuses, and appear as quickly as electricity can heat a filament. But creativity isn't magic. It happens by applying ordinary tools of thought to existing materials. And the soil from which we grow our creations is something we scorn and misunderstand even though it gives us so much, and that's copying. Put simply, copying is how we learn. We can't introduce anything new until we're fluent in the language of our domain. And we do that through emulation. For instance, all artists spent their formative years producing derivative work. Bob Dylan's first album contained 11 cover songs. Richard Pryor began his stand-up career doing a not very good imitation of Bill Cosby. 
and Hunter S. Thompson retyped The Great Gatsby just to get the feel of writing a great novel. Nobody starts out original. We need copying to build a foundation of knowledge and understanding. And after that, things can get interesting. After we've grounded ourselves in the fundamentals through copying, it's then possible to create something new through transformation. Taking an idea and creating variations. This is time-consuming tinkering, but it can eventually produce a breakthrough. James Watt created a major improvement to the steam engine because he was assigned to repair a Thomas Newcomen steam engine. He then spent 12 years developing his version. Christopher Latham Scholes modeled his typewriter keyboard on a piano. This design slowly evolved over five years into the QWERTY layout we still use today. And Thomas Edison didn't invent the light bulb. His first patent was improvement in electric lamps, but he did produce the first commercially viable one after trying 6,000 different materials for the filament. These are all major advances, but they're not original ideas so much as tipping points in a continuous line of invention by many different people. But the most dramatic results can happen when ideas are combined. By connecting ideas together, creative leaps can be made, producing some of history's biggest breakthrough. So that's an important part. That's, uh, you have all these ideas uh, that you, you, know, you thought of uh, during the marathon, and now I think combination is really what can really improve things a lot. So think about this. Johann Gutenberg's printing press was invented around 1440, but almost all its components had been around for centuries. Henry Ford and the Ford Motor Company didn't invent the assembly line, interchangeable parts, or even the automobile itself, but they combined all these elements in 1908 to produce the first mass-market car, the Model T. And the internet slowly grew over several decades as networks and protocols merged. It finally hit critical mass in 1991 when Tim Berners-Lee added the World Wide Web. These are the basic elements of creativity. Copy, transform, and combine. And the perfect illustration of all these at work is the story of the devices we're using right now. So who invented the computer? Uh, I'm Turing. That's, that's a good point, actually, from a ma 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 mathematical standpoint, yes. Okay, but uh, it's, we talk about the modern computer, the, the, the PC you have there. But it's a good point, thank you. Yeah. Any, any, any other answer? Okay. It's not IBM. So let's travel back to the dawn of the personal computer revolution and look at the company that started it all. Xerox. Xerox invented the modern personal computer in the early 70s. The Alto was a mouse-driven system with a graphical user interface. Bear in mind that a popular personal computer of this era was operated with switches, and if you flipped them in the right order, you got to see blinking lights. The Alto was way ahead of its time. Yeah. Eventually, Apple got a load of the Alto, and later released not one, but two computers with graphical interfaces, the Lisa and its more successful follow-up, the Macintosh. The Alto was never a commercial product, but Xerox did release a system based on it in 1981, the Star 8010. Two years before the Lisa, three years before the Mac. It was the Star and the Alto that served as the foundation for the Macintosh. The Xerox Star used a desktop metaphor with icons for documents and folders. It had a pointer, scroll bars, and pop-up menus. These were huge innovations, and the Mac copied every one of them. But it was the first combination it incorporated that set the Mac on a path towards long-term success. Apple aimed to merge the computer with the household appliance. The Mac was to be a simple device, like a TV or a stereo. This was unlike the Star, which was intended for professional use and vastly different from the cumbersome command-based systems that dominated the era. The Mac was for the home, and this produced a cascade of transformations. Firstly, Apple removed one of the buttons on the mouse to make its novel pointing device less confusing. Then they added the double click for opening files. The Star used a separate key to open files. The Mac also let you drag icons around and move and resize windows. The Star didn't have drag and drop. You moved and copied files by selecting an icon, pressing a key, then clicking a location. 
and your resized windows with a menu. The Star and the Alto both feature pop-up menus, but because the location of these would move around the screen, the user had to continually reorient. The Mac introduced the menu bar, which stayed in the same place no matter what you were doing. And the Mac added the trash can to make deleting files more intuitive and less nerve-wracking. And lastly, through compromise and clever engineering, Apple managed to pare the Mac's price down to $2,500. Still pretty expensive, but much cheaper than the $10,000 Lisa or the $17,000 Star. But what started it all was the graphical interface merged with the idea of the computer as household appliance. The Mac is a demonstration of the explosive potential of combinations. <laughs> okay, so, so you can watch this for, for this is actually 20 more, yeah, about 17 more minutes. Uh, we're not gonna watch it today, but like, I'm, I'm gonna put the link for you guys in, uh, in the thing. It's quite interesting, and I think it's interesting to, to know that this is really how things happen. Right? How things, how things happen and this is uh, how new products are created. So and it's always uh, a tipping point of a combination of technology that exists and people just put together, hey, that's it. So that's the, uh, uh, you know, to, uh, to some extent, uh, what happened to my, oh, okay. I think I have to come back there. Um, I copy that thing and then I'll put it in the um, I'll put it in the calendar here so you have it. Um, so you can go back in this and um, there you go. All right, so it's now in your calendar. You go on the first thing here and you have the uh, link on the YouTube <coughs> thing here. All right, so that's the. Um, Oops. So that's what the, the summary of the first class. I also uh, mentioned that to you. I think it's important because once you have, uh, once you work with uh, people, uh, there's a lot of things that uh, needs to be taken into account. And working uh, with colleagues is something that is quite challenging because you know everybody's different, different personalities, and and so please uh, try to apply these four rules. This uh, four ba basic rules of brainstorming, focus and quantity, you no know, criticism, encourage wild ideas, combine and improve ideas. Uh, movie was mostly about the fourth uh, point here. Put a little bit of thing back. All right. So that concludes the uh, class that we had. And now uh, there's a few uh, uh, more charts I I'd like to show you for, for the idea scope assessment. So what, what we'll do next is to give you uh, uh, some tools to uh, make an ID uh, flourish, make it a bit more uh, meaty, uh, trying to put some more details, and that's it. Uh, thing. So let's take a break since we had like a, already a good session, and uh, and we'll uh, recess in. Uh, we'll resume in um, in uh, about 15 minutes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So. That's the uh, idea scope assessment will help you to go to the next stage with your ideas. It's basically a way to put more information around the idea and um, you know, making sure it's, uh, it's nicely described. So how does, it does that connect with what we've seen so far? Uh, I mentioned to, to you before that I like to use this framework on assessing three types of assumptions on, on the ideas, uh, namely, you know, assumption under desirability, viability, and feasibility. I think this, I think it's a good framework, uh, but obviously uh, you need to fully assess this, you need a bit more information about the context. So let me explain what that is. Everything that is connected to the market, right? Where people will use your product, uh, you know, enjoy uh, the thing you created is about desirability. Do people want your product? So that's really the, uh, the, the, the thing here. And everything that is connected, or most of the things that are connected with viability and feasibility, that mostly, that's important if you, if you have a company behind that product. 
Because if your goal is just to put the product in open source and people can use it freely without paying anything, so you know, whether it's viable or, or feas feasible, obviously it's, a, it's, a, it's an important aspect, but viability is less important because, because actually you, know, you, don't, you, you don't try to return a, a profit from uh, uh, that, uh, that product. But if you want to return a profit, you need to know the context uh, for that. So viability is important if this is taken in the scope of a company. And this is what actually you guys are facing with uh, your project. You have, each of you have a sponsor company. Uh, you know, we call it Le Mondon. And, uh, and, and you know, they expect to, to get something out of your work. And uh, it could be a new product, it could be a new service. And, uh, and that happens. Uh, just to, to remind you that, uh, you know, previous year actually, uh, I think some of the projects led to a new product at Logitech and, and one at Falco. So it was quite successful. So, so there's really a hope that the work, the good work that you guys did might actually pay off for, for the company that uh, mandated you for that work. So, and feasibility uh, is obviously a very important aspect uh, uh, because it all depends on the budget that you have. Right? Depends how much money you know you're gonna put in that uh, in that uh, in that product, and 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 you know also what type of skills that you have at your disposal. You know you might actually need skills in some area that you don't have. Like for instance, if you're trying to make like an a, an AI type of product, and nobody in your team has any experience with machine learning or the likes, then it might be quite challenging. So. That's pretty much the, uh, the important thing. When you're trying to fully assess viability and feasibility, you need the economical context and the like. So corporate metrics. So this is when you start working with uh, your, your co the company who mandated you, Le Mondon. Uh, you need actually to know, and I think this is why you had, uh, I was pleased to learn that uh, Actually, some of your sponsor company people came to uh, the idea marathon that you had in the, in the mountains. And, uh, and, and actually, they could, they could give you some of this uh, feedback. So uh, whether an idea is appropriate for a company or not depends on the company innovation goals, objectives, and the like. OK, so the first thing is that uh, company have strategies uh, for growth, for innovation, and these ideas must obviously fit that. It could be a very good idea, but not for that company. So always be aware that uh, uh, you could be very motivated by your idea, but if it is not aligned with the company strategy and innovation goals, they're not going to pay too much attention, right? So you can actually skip this idea for your next venture, and uh, you know. The second thing is that. So that's, for, that's for the first point. The second point is that there are different levels, also called horizon, for an idea. An idea could be implemented right, right away because we all have the competencies, we all have uh, uh, you know, the budget, we all have like, uh, the, 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 the timing is good. But some ideas could only be implemented like, you know, after a year, two years, because we need to do some research first, research and development, we need to acquire another company to do so, we need s several things. We don't have all the components for it. So you need also to understand that ideas come with different horizons. And I'll, I'll, I'll teach you how to classify ideas depending on horizon. There's a framework for this that you could definitely use in your Cahier des Idées and make sure that you actually specify, okay, this idea is horizon one, this idea is horizon two, Horizon 3. It's very important to understand this and, and the, uh, to understand where an idea fits in, the, in, in a given horizon really depends on your context of the company you're working with and, and your team and, and the people you have in, the, in your team. So, and the last thing, assessment metrics or criteria you are must satisfy, they're always going to be assessment metrics. Like for instance, a simple one is that if people give you a budget of a million Swiss francs, then you have to be able to develop in a million Swiss francs. You cannot have a, a planning that will take 10 times that, that amount. 
So you always have metrics uh, that will give. So it's good actually to, when you discuss with a company who sponsor your project, making sure that you understand what are their priorities. That's really the, the key message here. Portfolio management is that when an idea, when a company has a set of ideas and they need to manage them, right? So basically, uh, uh, you know, portfolio is a way uh, to manage a set of ideas and, and companies will always have uh, such a set, you know, under the hood and, and they will uh, they, they will push some of these ideas, depends on, depending on the priorities. But, the, you know, a good company actually, uh, it's, uh, we always have a portfolio of ideas. And we need to turn ideas, project into expertise for, for the company. So basically, uh, it's, every company is always in the learning process. So basically, companies are learning things as they go, especially like everybody, like you're learning. Uh, don't make the assumption, especially, uh, I think you understand really this when you get some experience in the industry. But don't get into the assumption that company not, always know what they're doing. A lot of company that, you know, they're just trying to understand what to do. But they don't really know what they're doing, right? Uh, it could be startup company, but also mature companies. Because everybody's testing the market, is trying to understand how to you know make it make it there be successful, so that's why uh, you know you need always to see a company as something in the, that goes through a learning process. So when you discuss with your sponsor company, understand that they they're also going to learn from you, from your experience, right? And they don't know everything. They don't have answer to all your questions. Okay. So if you ask a question, what are you guys going to do with this? And they say, we don't know. That's normal. This is just the way it is. There's always an expectation. People, you think people know what they're doing in companies. That's not the case. Okay? So, and I, I, I experienced this many times in, in my life, you know, including my, my current company. Everybody, and it's, it's normal. It's, it's expected. But, like, sometimes I explain to my employees that you should have, you know, expectation that, uh, you know, things are always going through a learning process. Um, and just to give you an idea, uh, this uh, uh, portfolio management actually is, is implemented in some tools. Uh, companies have tools to implement that type of practices and uh, actually we'll, we'll look at some of these tools in uh, uh, the next class, actually the one after that. Okay, so how to select the right idea, okay? I, there's many questions you know, that you can try to answer here, but uh, should, you, should you test them all, or should you test only some of them? Okay, that's the first thing you need to, to, to decide. Uh, in the process with the tool, I think that's the point of the shortlisting. When we shortlist ideas, we say, hey, this one I think is worth to test. This one is worth to test. We don't have time to test all the ideas. So, so you gotta shortlist some of them, and, and to test them. So that's basically uh, uh, what well, you should see, like the one you want to test, shortlist them and put them aside. That's the first step. Uh, next, uh, what aspect to test? Then, you know, desirability, viability, feasibility. I think actually this is what we discussed. Also, how should we go about testing? As much as possible, aim for behavior. That really uh, applies well to uh, ideas that are connected to the market, you know, trying to see if people are interested in this product, okay? It, it doesn't, I don't think you need to have a behavioral testing for feasibility or, or, or viability. This is more like, you know, studying how you can turn some profit with this idea. And how should we measure the results? Uh, choose metric case by case. So I think you are fine with this. Uh, the um, um, the scorecard that you guys sent me actually is a, an example of this. I think uh, I, I proposed myself like a few metrics to evaluate your ideas, but I was glad to see that when you guys came back to me with your own suggestions, some reused the thing I suggested, but like you also put your own spin on it. And I think that was, uh, that was a good thing. Okay, so, and, and, you, and, and this is answered in the corporate environment. 
Um, so also, now let's talk about viability and feasibility. So you understand what viability is? In, in short, what, what's viability? Do you remember? I think it's when uh, uh, project is, uh, is going to be something. To be? Something. Mm -hmm. I know that it's going, uh, in the end, we, ha we can do it. No. Well, what's, what, what does it mean to be vi Sorry, what does it mean to be vi viable? Viability or rentability. Voilà. Uh, in, in terms of economics. Okay? So, so it's rentability, basically. It's like you can make money with it. This is what it is really to be viable. Okay? So you look at viability of the projects. Like, if we sell this, you know, can we make money with that? Uh, and it could, only, it could not only, hey, can we sell this for a good price or not, but... Hopefully, we don't incur too much cost, right? Because, you know, it could be a good idea because, uh, you know, people would like this, but if there's too much cost for that, you know? So, for instance, like, it could be, obviously, a very good idea to sell ice cream in the desert because people, you know, they're very hot, they were very happy to. But, like, to keep the ice cream cold in the desert might cost you a lot of money, right? Because you need, uh, you need like, a, you know, refrigerated truck or something like that. So it might not be viable because you might have to sell your ice cream so much money to make a profit. So see, that's the thing. So viability is real. So think about viability. And viability, it will be very difficult to think if you don't know the economics of your company, right? You need, and what's, what's, when you talk about viability, what's the most difficult thing to do? What do you think? When you try to assess viability of your product, what do you think is the most difficult thing to do? First, will the public accept it? Will the public accept it? Yeah, that, well, that's exactly that. That's that's first for the market, but then uh, let's just talk about economics. What, what when you when you create a new company? I, I had this in my uh, one of my uh, start, uh, actually all my startup companies. Is that how much do you sell your product for? People always ask this question when you create a company and you create a product. Like, how much can I sell this? Right? So that's always a tricky question at the beginning. You, you try to understand how much can I sell this? Right? What's the answer? Oh, yeah. It's a rhetorical question. <laughs> so obviously the answer will be like it depends on the cost that you have. Right? Because you need first to assess the cost and then to see how you can turn a profit to be as well. So obviously the, uh, we had this in the, uh, the video that I showed you that before. Uh, the element of creativity. What, what, what was the, uh, the turning point for the personal computer that Apple actually was able to do? He, he put an example, he compared with the Macintosh, he compared this to the Lisa and the, to uh, the one from Xerox. What's the... Uh, really yeah, exactly. So they were able to, to, to build uh, uh, the, the computer for uh, $2,500. $2,500, okay? Where the Lisa was like 7,000 or 10,000 and the Xerox 17,000, right? So that's viability, it's, it's all about this. How cheap can you build to make it a, 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 you know, attractive to, to your market, right? So, I mean, that's gonna be a quick, quick question where you're trying to uh, uh, deal with your, uh, your product is that you know, you try to, but viability is, is really something that you will discuss with uh, your, your company, right? Because it's, uh, you don't have all the economics uh, or all the context for, for the economics, uh, you know, from your perspective, because you're more like an R&D team. And feasi what's, what's feasibility in that case? What's the, what's the goal of feasibility? You know, tell me, who, who can tell me? You. The tool to build it. Yeah. And the skills and the competences. This is really the you know is that feasible, right? So so how do you how do you how do you ca how can you assess feasibility? A good way to assess feasibility. It's just. Uh, it's, uh, does it already exist? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, that's a good way to start. Is to do a proof of concept. So exactly what I did with the idea wall is that I come up with this concept. I, I wanted to have replace this post-it 
and come up with a way to display and to increase the amount of ideas we put in the tool. So that's the concept, right? And what I did, I look, is there any way that exists to implement it? So what did I, what did I do to assess visibility? I, yeah, I went, to, I went to GitHub, I looked for project, I looked for code, I looked for things that exist, I looked at existing product, I found, hey, Keep actually is good, right? Keep could be exactly help us to do this, right? But you have to use Keep with multiple accounts, you know, thing. So a tweak, but that's the tweak, right? So, so when you want to assess feasibility, then try to do a proof of concept, see what exists, and assemble things. And remember, that, that was also about the movie today. That's why I showed you that. It's, it's okay and actually it's very important to use what exists already. Don't be shy, think, hey, it always exists, it's too... No, no. It exists, but you combine things that exist. And this is how you come up with something new. You combine existing things. It's, remember, it's a, innovation is a tipping point in the process. So you might actually be assembling, combining the right stuff, and, and you get it, right? You don't, it's very rarely it's 100% new or 50% or 80% new. It's sometimes, mostly it's 5% new only, okay? So that's the, um, that's, uh, that, so that's the whole goal of doing a proof of concept. If you want to know more about proof of concept, I said that's the, the class I'm teaching in Japan. The, t the class I'm teaching there is actually how to build proof of concept. That's actually why also I, I create the idea wall. And uh, I will put um, uh, the videos uh, from my class on YouTube. And the good news, that's why I'm putting them on, uh, on my channel this year, is because when I came this year, there was um, half of students were Japanese, half were non-Japanese. So we decided to do a bilingual class. So I'm teaching a little bit in English. Then I repeat the same thing in Japanese, then in English. So, so if, if you watch the video, you'll be able to understand the English part of it. So you, you'll be able, once I get the, the DVD, I'll put this on my, on my YouTube channel. All right, any question? No? Yeah? How can we assess desirability? Oh, can we assess desirability? Okay, so we, we, good question. Who can answer that? Yeah, exactly. That's very good. So I mentioned. Did you did you understand the question, guys? Yeah, guys, did you did you get did you, did you hear his question? Did you hear his question? Do you want to repeat your question? Sorry about my accent. <laughs> <laughs> how can we access the third um, metric desirability? How how can we assess desirability? Consumer research, behavioral testing, right? So think about desirability, consumer research, behavioral testing, opinion testing, all those things, right? And you're gonna because you're gonna do all this with your ideas. Yeah. Just for B two B business, how? That's that's investing? a good question. How can we assess desirability for B two B business? Then it's you have to ask companies. You have to try to assess the market in. Uh, the, it, it's important to understand that. B2C, behavior, behavioral testing is not only for B2C, right? It can also be applied to B2B. There's really no restriction. There's no reason why you cannot apply to B2B. But obviously, it's a bit trickier because it's more difficult to choose company to work with, right? I mean, so we can discuss about details for this, but uh, yeah, it's definitely possible to do behavioral testing on B2C, uh, a B2B uh, product as well. So desirability is... Uh, behavioral testing, opinions, and, and the likes. Viability is understanding the economics, making sure the cost is not too high, you can turn a profit. And feasibility is try to assess you know, it with the proof of concept, trying to see what exists. So in short, I think it's very important that you, you remember that thing. Now, uh, the uh, portfolio, uh, portfolio management metrics. Okay, uh, when you manage multiple ideas, you you would actually give uh, some low priority, some high priority, you know, this, lots of different things. But like, uh, I think one way also to to go to do this is to 
use the three horizon framework. So that's something that uh, I'm, I'm using uh, uh, for this class since the beginning. People use a lot of this in their cahier des idées or cahier des scénarios. They actually uh, uh, classify a thing by three horizon. I want you to put this in your reports. I remember like the way I assess uh, the work for this uh, is like I would actually look at your cahier des idées and I will see how much of the thing we do here are included in the cahier des idées. That's the point, right? I, I, I don't want to give you an additional uh, homework or deliverable for this class. So I'm, I'm using the cahier des idées and I'm looking how much uh, of thing you learn here you put inside, right? Is that clear for everybody? Je répète en français? Je ne donne pas un, de, de travail additionnel pour cette classe, mais je mets une note sur le cahier des idées. Et la manière dont on met des notes, enfin, enfin moi et puis le, le reste du team, c'est qu'on regarde quelles sont les choses qu'on a appris dans ce cours que vous utilisez dans le cahier des idées. Donc typiquement, désirabilité, viability, feasibility, les trois horizons, comment classer les idées. C'est des choses qu'une fois que vous avez compris ça, si vous l'utilisez dans le cahier des idées, c'est vraiment le but de ce cours. So making sure that you understand this and you can apply it. So we'll look at the three horizons right now in, uh, in, in details. But I want to show you a few examples before. Um, yeah. So let me increase a little bit. Uh, this is a bit small. Okay, so the three horizon. This is a way you can classify your ideas. An idea is horizon one if it extends the core business. What's the core business of uh, the company? What, is, what, is, what does it mean, core business? <coughs> Who can tell me what uh, core business means? Anybody? Exactly. That's perfect definition. For core business, think of Coca-Cola, uh, then is creating soft cream. This is what all the, the brand behind Coca-Cola. This is what they do. So creating soft cream. That's that's the, that's the core business. So if your idea extend the core business, it's Horizon One. So you don't need anything else. You can actually create a new soft drink, for instance. We come up with an idea for a new soft drink. In your example, you could but you actually might gain market share with this ID, develop new channels, customer and territories. Like we could do new software from Japan, for instance, right? Okay? Develop new products and service on existing business, six months to revenue. So if you could say, okay, if we implement this, in six months we can make money with it. That's Horizon 1. Okay? So that's the first way to classify the idea. The second way here, is Horizon 2, build emerging business, businesses, okay? So here, we exploit current resources and develop one, to develop one to two year lead time, high potential product and businesses. In this case, additional development is needed for the, for the idea. So for this idea, if ID is Horizon 2, you need some more work to bring it to market, okay? Uh, it significantly overhaul uh, extend existing businesses. So it extends existing businesses, but it reuse a lot of the thing. Develop, but it develop new technology. So this a little bit new, something we haven't done before, but uh, we de developing new technology, and it's six months to two years to revenue. So before you make any money with Horizon 2, like it will be six months to two years. You give yourself up to two years to make money with that. Okay? Horizon 3, is create viable future options. So it's for prom promise, promising ideas, develop ideas into opportunities, create new market for new products. So see, you, need, you might need to acquire a new, uh, new, new team, acquire a company, develop new technology, and it's two year plus uh, uh, um, uh, to revenue. So you, you need at least two years of, of development. So typically, startup companies, right, a lot are there, okay? Because they need to work a few years because something quite new. There's nothing in the market that resembles that, and they need to develop that thing. So that's uh, that's basically the uh, 
the ID. So this three horizon uh, thing. I'm just going to give you a personal experience here based on geography. And uh, this is typically uh, an idea that uh, is uh, with horizon one. Uh, no, it's actually more horizon two because of the implementation. So uh, a few years ago, I, I worked with uh, farming in Africa. So I had like, um, um, I helped a farmer to develop this technology to, um, to uh, uh, improve the culture of rice. You know, because Africa, the issue is that uh, the, co the cultivation is not self-sustaining. So people just grow for themselves and barely. They don't, they don't have enough technology or knowledge or practice to grow to export. So the issue with Africa, and especially Nigeria, which I know quite well, is that uh, they have all the surface to cultivate rice, but they have to import rice because they cannot cultivate enough because they don't have the technique, the machinery, the experience and stuff. So that's one of the big issues for Africa, is that they need to import a lot of goods. So what's the issue with importing goods is that they have to pay for it and they increase their debt. That's why all these African countries, they have huge debts because they cannot sustain themselves. They can, the, the, the industry is not developed enough. And so, so that's one of the big issues. So the best way you can help uh, uh, such a continent and especially the countries there is that if you give them better technology to start first sustaining themselves and then be able to produce, to export and sell outside. That's the only way to take people out of poverty. There's no other way. Okay, so people have, because otherwise, you know, having debt is to be in bondage, right? Once you have debt, it's like you always have to pay your debt and uh, this is the way to keep people in bondage. So, so that's the, uh, the main issue. So what I did with my experience from Japan, because obviously this is not Africa, this is Japan, is that I looked at how rice culture was done in Japan because obviously there's a lot of tradition, a lot of experience, and I found a few things that could be interesting that they use in Japan, and uh, which is not directly related to the condition in Africa, but it could be reused. And one of the things that I found is that they actually uh, uh, developed a way to create a hummus from rice shaft. So rice shaft is basically, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, Around rice, you have like little uh, uh, shaft, and uh, and th this part actually it's sometimes it's removed from the rice, especially if we want uh, um, uh, to uh, uh, has that is sticky rice, that um, you know the one the one for instance they they, they use uh, they sell in Asia, and uh, so for this, if you use the rice shaft, which actually they get rid of in, in Africa you can actually create a hummus that will, that will keep moisture longer in the soil. And why, why this is important is because what's one of the main uh, issues with Africa is water. Right? It's difficult to bring. There's water, but it's underneath. And, and to bring it to the surface, what do you have to do? You have to pump. And how do you pump when you have no electricity? No, 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 by hand, this is over. I mean, people, that would be, here's the way with that. No, with diesel. You have to pump with diesel fuel. So you have diesel generator that help you pump the water. And what happens when everybody has a diesel generator everywhere? Pollution. pollution, huge pollution. If you go to Lagos, if you go to Africa, you don't see the blue sky. It's all gray because the whole country is running on diesel. The electricity grid is so bad there, there's, all, you know, there's barely like a few hours a day of electricity. So you cannot do farming, you can do anything like that. So, and especially in Kano, where I had the project is that um, you actually have to uh, uh, you know, pull the water from the well with using diesel. So it's very, very difficult. So the point of doing this is that if you bring this hummus technique, in the soil there, you will, bring, you will keep humidity, you moisture longer in the soil. So you don't need to punch, pump as much water. Or if you pump as much water, you have a better yield with the rice. So you can produce more. So that, that's, that's, that's the whole point. And, um, uh, you know, farming is, is, is a technology that evolves very slowly. And, uh, and 
you know, it's not because it exists somewhere in the world that people will know it or people will use it. And everything about this technology was written like this in Japanese. So the first thing I did actually, I translated this document. I explained to the farmer how to do this and how to apply this thing. So this is basically how you transfer technology from one side to the other. So that's, uh, that's typically how you can take an idea from one country, Japan, and go implement it in some other country. And uh, people never heard about this thing there. Because, you know, it's not because they exist somewhere in the world, they exist everywhere. So also be aware that, you know, geography really matters, culture matters, uh, lots of things. So that's an example. And we implemented this. That was in 2012. Those are the people we implemented. So this is Alaji Dogo is, is the farmer in, uh, in, in, uh, close to Kano in Nigeria. And uh, so we applied this. This is the hummus. This is how we did it, okay, with the shaft. And we create the hummus ourselves, and then we put it in the soil. And it, it can apply to rice farming. This is what his son, Mohammed. And they can also be applied to a harvest, uh, sorry, um, a horch orchard, then uh, 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 fruit farming. That's what we did. So just to give you an example, how you can take an ID from one side and bring something, something uh, some other side. Yeah. yeah. The objective is more social than economic. Yeah. yeah. How you can categorize or classify the, the idea? Because they don't have a revenue. The background maybe is a revenue, but not. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, here it was not to really turn a profit. Agree, yeah. Oh, it almost, it's not always you have to have a positive viability. You know, in that case, it was really, uh, you know, uh, it was really to, to, to help. Uh, right. So. So I'm, I'm giving an example of how you can take an idea from some part of the world to another part, and uh, it will be totally new. All right, that's mostly about uh, desirability is high here, but viability, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, you know. So this is a good question, yeah. But, uh, yeah. I, I did that, uh, I did that, um, uh, uh, I, I took like, uh, almost two years of sabbatical after working 12 years at IBM to uh, do this kind of project or to do something useful once. So. And how now that it's a viability project with your, hmm? like, it's social? Yeah. And it's not a viability project or idea. It's it could be social and viable, <laughs> huh? Okay. You don't think it could be social and viable? Oh, I don't know. No. Okay. No, I, I can tell you, it could be social and viable, yeah. In that case here, it was not, the goal was not to turn a profit. But for us, for uh -huh. example. Uh, for, for you. I think, I think yeah. I think uh, uh, likely the, 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 the sponsor company expects you to have something viable with the idea. Oh, but they will help you to assess if it is viable or not, right? That's, that's the goal. That's why I, mean, that, I, I, I like your question because uh, you need, don't think you're just by yourself and try to uh, uh, decide hey, if it is viable or not. Because for you, it will be difficult to assess because of your lack of experience and also lack of knowledge of the company itself. So you always have to work with the company who, who sponsor you to make sure that, you know, that they understand uh, uh, your idea and they, they can, uh, they can judge whether it's viable or not, right? Yeah. OK? OK, so <laughs> all right, so, so here was the company innovation goals. Uh, this is also something that, I, uh, that's, that connects to your question. I, I invite you to discuss uh, this with uh, uh, the company you work with. So define challenges, make sure you understand, uh, you know, what, what is important for them, define opportunities, discuss idea for solving each of the organization challenges, list this idea's opportunity. Uh, I think one thing that's going to be important when you work with your sponsor company is communication. Really the way you communicate these ideas and, and, and make sure that they, you know, they understand what are the implications. And they need to help you connect the dots with the company itself because you know, they might not spend a lot of time with you. They don't have perhaps the time to tell you all the important things for them. 
but like it's really a matter of communicating well with these companies to understand really what's important for them. So that, that's really the message of today. So that's why it will be important to understand the, uh, the company innovation goal. So uh, usually you can ask the company you work with to define uh, a three or four uh, uh, thing they would like to solve. I think perhaps you already did that, you know, when you, when they assess uh, the ideas you had, you had you have discussion with them to make sure that, uh, you know, you, und you guys understand each other in terms of what are the innovation goals and challenges. And I'll give you a few examples of this. Um, I'm just going to jump this one here. Okay, so let's work now on details of the idea assessment metrics. So how do we, how do we uh, 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 um, take an idea and put more details on it? Right? That's basically the, the thing perhaps you've done the last, this last days. And so first is, is to verify the source of the idea. What's, what's, uh, and this is mostly for the idea will, that will be shortlisted, right? When you get an idea, it's always actually a good practice to verify the source of the idea. What was what's the trigger for this idea? What was the, uh, the uh, reason why you came with that idea? So verify the source of the idea is it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a good thing. Then how to measure and send innovation priority. So that's basically uh, uh, horizon one, two, three. So once you verify the source of the idea, you, you should then verify if the idea belongs to horizon one two and three. So do this for your KDZ day, okay? And then, and this is the discussion you have also with the company, how do you think the idea will impact the company? And this multi, we'll, we'll actually look at different, uh, different type of impacts. Uh, actually, the next class is all about metrics because it can have impact, obviously, on the economics of the company, make more money, gain more market, extend a current market, extend geography. It can have impact on the brand, you know, making look the company uh, attractive to, you know, different type of market that they have right now. So they change their brand. It could be attractive now to teenagers, it could be attractive to elderies, you know. So there's multiple ways uh, that your idea can impact the company. So that's uh, the three things you can see. So first, idea source verification. What was the trigger for this idea? Second is, is the idea uh, under horizon one, two, and three, according to definition I gave before? And the last one is, how this idea will impact the company? So idea scope assessment, this is also for the source of the idea. How do you verify the source of the idea? And that's, I encourage you to apply this on all your ideas. Uh, the one that was shortlisted. So first of all, who is the user for your idea? Okay, you need to have an, an understanding when that applies. Who is the user? Okay, a clear and true understanding of the user. What are the needs? What are the needs addressed by the idea? Okay, what basically, which needs are answered by the idea? What are the features of the idea? I'll get back to this in the next chart. The feature of the idea is, uh, you know, how do you implement the idea, what type of features they provide to the, to the user. And the benefits. So this is like uh, the, the four parts for the uh, verification of the source of the idea you can apply. So verify the source of the idea using checking the user, the need, the feature, and the benefits. Let me tell you about the user. The first one, the user. So one thing that is bad to do is to say this idea is for the 40 years old or the 50 years old or the 30 years old. Why? Because it's too large a group to really understand what their concerns are. Okay? Uh, you can be 30, you can be 40 and have lots of things in common or you can be 30 and 40 have nothing in common. There's so many situations that when you try to understand the user for your idea, if you're being too broad, it's not going to give you a lot of information how to really make this idea successful. So instead of 
having this, you, it's better to have a target group. Uh, um, like, in, uh, sorry, instead of a target group, it's better to have like a, 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 a clear notion of the user. What I said before, women between 35 and 65 in urban area with an average income is too broad. There's too many types of women for this. Okay? So we can do instead, you can say, hey, this is my user. It's Sophia. She's 35 years old, mother of seven years old, old Max, and she works at Uncle Sushi Restaurant. Because if you define the user like this, you really understand what's the concerns every day. Because what's, if you look at this definition, what do you think is the first concern here? The first thing that comes to mind for this user? Yeah? Uh, her exactly. That's a good, the, the, the child. And what about the child? Uh, I don't know. She works at a restaurant, so she has to, uh, to... Do you have children? Do you have children? Uh, no? <laughs> you know. So you see, like, seven-year-old, the first thing you think, like, you have to bring them to school before you go to work. Yeah. And if you're a single mother, it's going to be, or a single father, it's going to be, yeah, I have to get, I can only get to work after I put my kid in school, right? This is the first thing you have in, in your head. So if your product, you know, for that person, perhaps doesn't take this into account, you know, because it's just supply, it's a general life product, something like this, then you have to understand her concern first, you know, she put the kid in school. And then she has to take, take him back from school. She has to, she has to find some. So, see, it's much easier to find specific concerns of people if you have such a definition than if you have this one here. Because there's so many cases in the first one that it's, uh, it's too broad. So the first thing, think about the user. Think about what are uh, 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 real concerns. And that will help you to focus the idea. Things, the need. For the need, there's very two important aspects of the need. Who knows what a market push and a market pull is? Who are, heard, heard, the, heard of this before? <coughs> uh, not always you. <laughs> so it's, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, push, push, market push is to push the technology to yeah. customers. So, okay. And market pull is uh, try to get insights from the market. Yeah. So that, that, that's a good definition, but it's difficult. It's too abstract for people to understand. No, no I, I know it because I know what you're saying because I understand the notion. But how can you explain this to people who haven't heard this before? It's a good question. So let me explain you. That's a very important notion to understand. A market push is that for your idea, there's no clear need in the market today. But you believe that when you push it to the market, you will create the need. Right? Lots of products come like this, right? And people didn't think it would really be useful or like, no, it would be useful, but like, they're like, people don't know they need it now, but once they use it, they say, hey, I need that thing. It's very useful to me, right? So that's a market push. So what's the market pool? What do you think is the market pool? The customer that wants something. And yeah, something exactly. The Very good. Thank you for answering. So the market pool is that we know the market needs it, and we answer to this need. Uh -huh. There's some research that was done, or we understand the market needs that, and we answer to that need. So see the need is that for your idea, there's not necessarily a need. You can create a need. And obviously, when you create a need, it, it gives you a good position in the market, right? Because, you know, you created a new uh, thing. So that's really important, right? So there's a, a bit of definition here. And, uh, and so that's important. What are the features? For the feature of, the, of sorry, the features of the idea, this is something that, if, okay, there you go. This is something that can help you to find the features of the idea is that if you want to implement something, you have to find all the steps that how people can use the product or the idea. Okay? So typically here, 
This is a representation here that is used to uh, um, describe how an idea will work. So, and you can describe the customer experience. Last year, I have somebody in the KDZ day using that exactly that explain every step of the idea. So he, he created that graph again. And you can say, you can use icon, uh, describe the customer experience so that the customer experience is a make or break moment. Uh, where do we need a data to, to, you know, to implement this thing? So you can actually describe things. So this is basically you know, uh, a boarding procedure in the plane. And, uh, and this is what happened before you board, during the boarding, and after the boarding here. So you can explain every step of a process of an idea using that. So that's, that's a, you don't need to do this, and you cannot do this for all ideas, but typically the winner ideas, it's useful when they implement it like that. Last, what are the benefits? If only I can scroll with that thing. Okay. What are the benefits of the idea? Obviously, this is linked to the experience of the features. So basically, if you create that, that type of representation, it will be possible to explain all the benefits for each step, right? And you can derive like the global benefit for your idea. But using that, actually, you can describe all the benefits for each step. So that's basically a way to define. So that was the, um, that was the, uh, the, you know, the way to describe the scope of an idea. So in summary, you can look at, let me just put it back here. On this chart. Okay. Idea source verification. I'll explain that. The next chart explains you how to do it. Innovation priorities with the three horizon and how to assess the idea impact on the company key performance indicator. For the last thing here, this is what we'll do next class. We'll look at the metrics for the company, but like for this class here, try to apply these two things, idea source verification so you can develop your ideas and how to measure and set innovation priorities. For the, for, for the KDZ day, it's actually quite useful to go use that. So idea source verification, user need, feature and benefits, and the innovation priorities, the three horizons that we have here. So look at the definition of the horizons. And I think some of you clearly understood what it was. But if you need more information, actually, uh, you can have the, you can look at the next charts. In the next set of charts, they have uh, lots of details about this. But this is what the, uh, the thing is now. So I think for the KDZ day, it will be quite useful to apply uh, the idea source verification, which is here. User need, feature, and benefit, and the three horizons here. Let me know if you have any question. Uh, that's the last charts for today. If you have any question about this or need more information when preparing the KDZ day, uh, you can actually post in the discussion um, uh, that link to today's class. You can post all your questions in here. Please post them there so we can have, actually, for everybody can benefit. Uh, I'll put the um, discussion here. So let me just actually add here the link to the discussion so you can look at the link for the discussion. Uh, okay, so. Put the discussion and I put the, uh, well, I'll, I'll, let me create one. So the class about, any question about class? Uh, questions um, about class three. Uh, just do that. A little liking. There you go. And then uh, I put this in the calendar so you guys can uh, can ask me questions about today's class, since it's actually quite uh, timely because of the, uh, 
the KDC day. The, the, so here questions. There you go. Class three. So I put the link here. So if you go on today's class, then you can see question about class three. You click here, and you can go and, and ask your questions here. OK? All right, so we're done for today. Uh, I'll um, give you a break. And uh, for 15 minutes.